Today I'll be reviewing AP World History Unit 5, Revolutions. So let's get started. So we're first starting off with the Enlightenment, which basically was an era of ships and traditions and customs. And basically new ideas of thought were created, both, both, techno, both in forms of technology, along with forms of thinking of how people are governed, how people should live and things like that. So there's basically at this point, there's a lot of new schools of thought, such as socialism, liberalism, you know, capitalism, you know, and this era was basically known as the age of isms. And one important ism that you just gotta know, as it's so important and prevalent in history from the 1700s all the way to modern times is the idea of nationalism or the feeling of loyalty towards one country. And so enter this guy named John Locke and his picture is shown, shown over here. And so what he thought of, uh, thought of was basically a social contact between the government and the people of the country. And so what the social contract was was that people gave up rights to the government so the government could give law and order. And this basically a trading of a little bit of your freedom in order to gain security was basically, basically uh, monumental in history for modern day, for the modern day, and it's shown a lot nowadays. And like John Locke, there were a ton of philosophers such as Adam Smith and Karl Marx. And so now we go into Adam Smith. And Adam Smith was an advocate for laissez fair economies, or basically an economy where the government is kicked out and it's all just run by the businesses. And this idea is turned into capitalism, which is basically meaning that the means of production are owned by companies. And along with that, you have a you have an antagonist to capitalism, which is socialism, which basically is the exact opposite, where public ownership is the mean of the means of production is the main idea. So you're basically with capitalism, you're having private businesses and private owners taking control of the means of production or how things are made. While with socialism, you basically have the public or the people, the workers, basically owning all the means of production or you know they're the ones making what is needed. Along with that, you have feminism, which is basically a movement for women's rights and equality. And at this point, there is a lot of movements for equality. And, and one other one of this is abolitionism, which basically was a movement to end the Atlantic slave trade. And it worked out pretty well with, with basically, with, uh, Denmark being the first to abolish it in 1803, and the, and then England in 1807 with the United States finally abolishing the Atlantic slave trade in 1808. So along with that, while you have this age of isms, and you also have the end of serfdom, which already had been declining for a while, but, but basically got abolished by 1574 in England, but Oh, that's 1989, my bad, it's 1789. So what happened was that France basically abolished any privileges of the nobility by 1789. And so forgive my error in writing it, that was a mistake of mine. And so by then you basically had the end of serfdom in almost all countries in the, in the world at that point. The only other country that that did not end it was basically Russia, who won the abolished serfdom in 1861. And one interesting fact to denote with this is that the emancipation of 23 million serfs was the largest emancipation of people in bondage in human history. And lastly, as we finish this off, we have Zionism, which is basically the desire for Jewish people to live in their homeland where they originally lived. So let's move on to 5.2, nationalism and revolutions. So there's mainly three revolutions that you just gotta know for the AP test. And the main three are the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution. 
So the American Revolution, as most people in a U.S. history class would know, it was caused as basically the American citizenry being angry with the British military along with the British government, the Parliament of England, for unfair representation and basically not giving any form of representation without, while still taxing them and putting unfair liberties. However, the the uh, information is a, a bit more deeper and I can't get into that too much due to the interest of time. However, it'll be a good conversation for a later time. And so I guess people would know about the American Revolution a lot more than they know about the French or Haitian Revolution. So the thing with the French Revolution is that basically what happened was that uh, France had a lot of economic woes. So they basically had a couple of wars, such as the Seven Years' War, along with funding the United States during the Revolutionary War, which basically made them broke. And this, along with basically inequality in the government, which was basically the Estates General, caused a lot of resentment by the, the, the regular average citizen. And based this, along with a lot of other issues, such as um, uh, anger with the monarchy, anger with uh, the clergy, and unfair taxation, led to a lot of issues and led to revolution. I again can't go too much into it, but then I would love, I would recommend if you really just want to know about it and have a bit of time and want like a bit more fun take on it. I would recommend watching Oversimplified. The guy's great and. He's, he made my day. At times, it was pretty funny. And last revolution that we have is the Haitian Revolution. So Haiti was basically a French colony, and it was basically uh, an area where uh, slaves were there, and they basically mined and got cash crops. And so the slaves basically revolted against the oppression and worked to create a new country. And this basically led to the the only independent country that was created due to a slave uprising, which never happened again, pretty much. And so, again, can't talk too much in the interest of time, but yeah, it's there's a lot more history into it, and it's much more interesting. And so you also have to be able to compare the French, Haitian, and American revolutions. And the thing is, the American revolution was kind of different from the French and Haitian revolutions. So if you know your history with the American revolution and French and Haitian revolutions, it's easy to make a comparison. But then with the French and Haitian revolution, the main differences you should note is that the French and Haitian were similar due to enlightenment ideals uh, basically given out along along with some other ideas. But then the main, the main difference is that the Haitian revolution was caused due to much greater oppression caused by the, the, the rebellers or the, the slaves being oppressed a lot more. And so, yeah. So, and now we get to some more revolutions. So now you have the Creole revolutions and the Creoles were basically an ethnic group in Mexico that had revolutionary ideas. Well, not Mexico, my bad. Uh, in Latin America that had revolutionary ideas. And so basically what happened with the end of it was that um, the Creoles who had those revolutionary ideas, they basically wanted more power due to Spain, the people who were uh, charge of the colonies in Latin America, uh, putting their own people or people who, who were basically born in Spain in charge. And so they wanted more power. So what they did is that they started revolutions, which basically ended up in them getting a lot of power while everyone else, well, it stayed the same for everyone else. And the true end result of this was that the Creoles got power, but then the government was still conservative. And there was basically a little gain for minorities or women, I bad for the mistake. And you also tie, tie this whole thing back to nationalism. And so the thing with nationalism is that basically in the Balkans, what you're having is that you're having a waning amount of Ottoman control. 
and the Ottomans have been declining for a while now. They're basically considered as a sick man of Europe. And so due to this, there's a greater amount of nationalism in places like Greece, Serbia, Bosnia, and other former Ottoman territories and places like that. And so it led to more freedom of ex expression and thought. And it led to a greater appreciation of their culture, which was very rich. And over time, this led to independence. And while the Ottomans were waiting, they did try to do some things to combat this. And so the Ottomans, they thought that they should be a bit more nationalistic. And this idea was known as Ottomanism, or a movement that aimed to create a more modern unified state. And the way officials tried to do this was by minimizing Sorry, by minimizing the ethnic, linguistic, and religious differences across the empire. And they did this by taking control of local schools. And the best way to change a country's population's view on something is by going through the kids. And that's been tried throughout history. And so basically, they created a standardized school system, which um, effectively, well, how do I say this? With so they basically did this by creating a more nationalistic viewpoint in the school system, by creating a curriculum that's more, more uh, uh, straightforward and less like different. So everyone was basically together. And now we go on to the future of nat nationalism, which basically the, the whole world right now is starting to become a lot more globalist than nationalist. Although there are still sprockets of nationalism, the, the worldwide trend is predicted to go into globalism, but then there are starting to be some sprockets of resistance with that. And there is starting to be a rise of nationalism a lot more in some countries, while in other countries it's starting to decline. So yeah, let's go on to 5.3, the Industrial Revolution. Just yeah, drink some water. So the industrial revolution. So what you have is industrialization, which is the increased mechanism of production and the social changes that accompany this shift. And so basically industrialization started out mainly in England. And in England, what you had was you had a, a lot, a greater amount of industrialization in agriculture. And one tool of this was crop rotation or basically putting different crops in different points of the year. And you can see this if you go to a farm or other places where crops are made, as you can basically change X, like strawberries, then go to, I don't know my farming stuff. So you could go to strawberries, you can go to potatoes, then carrots, you know, you can just switch them out. And you also had industrialization with clothing, clothing with technology such as spinning jenny and the water frame being created. So Britain basically had an advantage when it came to industrialization with raw materials, colonization, rivers, and one of the best navies in the world, until 1945, that is. So the raw materials that they had were coal and a ton of it. And this coal led to them being able to produce fuel, which was monumentally helpful. You also had iron and wood, which would help with creating ships, creating, uh, creating others and trains and other things. And you also had the ability to colonize other territories, which allowed Britain to gain resources that they wouldn't have had and which made their life easier, such as rubber, spices, palm oil, etc. And you also had rivers, which basically allowed for improved logistics and an easier way to get out of get large amounts of stuff into London or into the urban centers where industrialization was growing rapidly while, while you can also go out of the out of the area into get a lot of ships out. So yeah. And that also ties into the Navy, which allowed you to police areas along with being able to basically have control over lots of areas. So, yeah. 5.4, industrialization spreads. So the thing is, in places like France and Germany, France did not industrialize too much due to their wars, such as 
such as the, Re the French Revolution, Napoleon, and etc. And so due to this, uh, due to the, these issues and the instability, they could not industrialize too much at that point. However, they, they could do it later. Along with that, what happened was that the, the urban centers of France were sparsely populated, which meant that there wasn't that much people that were available to work in those factories. Now let's go on to Germany. So Germany was basically fragmented into multiple different states and areas, and they weren't even united until, uh, until uh, 1871 with, uh, I forgot the name, it's, it's Ka uh, Kaiser William, I believe, Kaiser William, I'm not sure. I think it's Kaiser William. So once they were reunited at, in 1871, they started to industrialize a lot more. And with this, they started to become a great and large exporter of steel and coal. Now the United States had a large leading industrial force due to having a great workforce and due to this they're uh, allowed to they were able to basically have a huge economy due to just having a ton of people they could throw into a problem russia russia focused on a lot of railroads and the largest one the trans-siberian railroad is goes from moscow all the way to the pacific ocean and by 1900 russia had basically 36,000 miles of railroad connecting pretty much everywhere and you also have Japan, which was basically the first country in Asia to industrialize. And the reason for this industrialization was due to keeping their tradition safe from foreign, mainly American intervention. And you also had colonial territories uh, of countries such as India and Egypt, which were basically used as the hand of the colonizers. So whatever the colonizers wanted, they used the col colonial territories as extra shipyards, extra places for textile production. However, this detrimentally impacted those colonies as the people in those colonies were forced into working on stuff that they did not need because the things that they were doing before, they need to survive. And if the British left or, think, or if they had issues, then they would lose food, they would lose their opportunities and it would be basically, there's nothing you can do. So yeah. 5.5, technology during the industrial revolution. So basically the main thing you have to think about for the first industrial revolution is coal. Coal is basically, it was a lifeblood of the Industrial Revolution due to its ability to create energy. And this led to the steam engine, which basically was like the precursor to pretty much everything we have today, in terms of cars, trains, electricity, boats. And so the steam engine allowed you to create like the first steam trains. It allowed you to create the first cars, even allowed you to create the first steamships, which were precursors to the modern ships. and you also, along with that, and this was more along the second, second industrial revolution, you had ships made of metal, which were mainly warships and military, military craft, but then it started to spread out more. And nowadays, pretty much all the ships in service, both in the military, along with being in civilian use, are made out of metal. And with the second industrial revolution, you have increases in steel production, oil, which allowed much more energy to be created. It, and you have most of them also in the United States and other countries, and that oil allowed you to create petroleum. Along with that, you have electricity, which allowed for street lighting and electric trains, along with a plethora of other things. And you finally have communications such as telegram, telephone, and radio, which allowed you to communicate halfway across the world. So it was basically a precursor to pretty much everything we have nowadays. So it was so important for our improvement in our world. 5.6, the garment's role in industrialization. So let's actually transition from Europe to Asia right now. So in Asia, so you first start out with the Ottomans who basically did not adopt Western technology. And due to this, due to a great decline 
they were basically nicknamed the sick man of Europe. And so due to their waning power and influence, other countries started to expand their empires in Ottoman land. And by the end of World War I, the Ottoman Empire was dissolved, forming Turkey now and a plethora of other countries. So along with that, you have China, which basically had a humiliation at the hands of the Europeans. And these hu uh, humiliations, along with a plethora of other issues, caused China to briefly become a republic. However, due to infighting and warring, by 1949, China became the became basically a, um, a communist country after a, a brutal civil war between the Chinese Communist Party and the Kuomintang. I believe that's how you say it, the, or the Chinese Nationalist Party. Now let's move on to Japan. So the thing with Japan is that everything they did in order to militarized and everything you see in Japan during World War II or during the 1930s, it was all started due to Western uh, overreach into their area. So Japan before still had the Tokugawa shogunate. They were still pretty much, well, well, they had the shogunate, they have samurai, you know, like you see sometimes in some anime. I never watch anime, so, you know. So what you have is with so in 1853, you had Commodore Matthew Perry, a U.S. naval officer. He came with a fleet of ships into Japan requesting for trade. And after, he came demanding for trade. And this basically caused widespread fears in Japan that their society will basically be gone. And, they'll, and they also saw the humili humiliation suffered to the Chinese by the Europeans. And they, they said, nope, we don't want anything to do with that. So they decided to modernize and improve their society. And from what I remember of it, what they did in order to do this was that they basically went to European countries and they got whatever ideas were best and they used that in order to modernize their society. And so why, by doing this, what they did is that they made the central government stronger. And so they basically abolished the samurai and the daimyo system and they basically uh, made the emperor much more powerful, along with having an extremely strong military. And this time was known as the Meiji Restoration, just so you know, in case or not to give it a name. So 5.7, economic developments. So with this, I'm just going to go into a brief idea on both corporations and what they are. So a corporation is basically a, a business chartered by stockholders. And one thing that you can say is a monopoly is that one company owns all the cards. And so one example of a monopoly could be College Board. Sorry, you never heard this from me, but yeah, College Board. Uh, let's think of another one. Oh, uh, maybe would Apple count? I think they have iOS as their main propri proprietary system. But then if you want something with iOS, you have to go to Apple and Apple only, while with Android, you have to go to, you know, a lot of companies. You have options, but then Apple, you have Apple. So along with that, you basically had companies working across boundaries, such as, and transnational companies, such as De Beers Diamonds, which basically was created in Cape Town, South Africa, but then it basically connected all British uh, colonies and it basically, and the guy creating it, Cecil Rhodes, he wanted to create a whole transportation system between those colonies. So basically that's an example of trans transnational companies. And with these corporations and with the time with industrialization, you have the rise of consumerism, which basically is the idea of spending money on things that you don't even need. And I believe all of us, and I can say for myself, we all spent things spent money on things that we ended up just not needing and just not using after like 10 minutes. And so this consumerism led to the rise of leisure activities. And while before you didn't have much leisure activities to do, you could get some books, you could do X or Y thing, but then life was pretty bleak. But then leisure activities basically gave you the ability both to think for yourself, 
that you're having fun and there's more to life than just work than just working for some greater good. But then you also had the ability, it was, it's like a whole like topic in and of itself to explain this whole part. So I don't want to go in too much into a tangent. And so some examples of these leisure activities are biking and boating. And there are a lot more today, such as, you know, going on a car ride, going on, going on a road trip, going on bakey to somewhere, you know, et cetera, or playing video games, you know. And now we go into the last couple of units, which, so we have 5.8, which is basically reactions to the industrial economy. So the thing is with industrialization, you had a, basically you had pretty harsh conditions when working. And so these first conditions basically led to calls for labor reforms. And one major activist of this was, um, uh, was Mother Jones, who uh, argued, for, argued for labor reform and basically described the deprivations of coal miners. And other people, such as Don, John Stuart Mill, argued, uh, tried to argue and address for for social reforms with industrialization. And you also had socialists, which who basically argued for a different change in system. And so what you had was the rise of labor unions, which basically were like the, the people for the workers who basically argued for their rights, for workers' rights. But then these were first banned by the government as enemies of trade. And this wasn't stopped until until a bit later by the 20th century due to, due to uh, it becoming more acceptable. And you also had an increase in the calls for voting rights, however, which basically uh, raised the amount of people who could actually vote for their leaders. And this continued on, however, until, 1920, until the 1920s, women could not vote. And lastly, you have child labor, which was extremely prevalent during the times. However, basically in 1843 in England, children under the age of 10 were banned from working in the coal mines. And by 1881, education became mandatory for British children between the ages of five to 10. And so basically this change uh, redefined the roles of children in, a, in an industrialized society. And along with that, you have one more ism, which is utilitarianism, which basically asks for the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So if you have to screw over like one or two people for the greater good of the many, it's basically like the adage of the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And so that's basically how you could think of it as. And along with that, you have this guy named Karl Marx, which I believe you would know of him. And he was basically a German scholar and a writer who argued for socialism. And he basically, he basically wanted to look at how the world actually operated and he wanted to confront the problems instead of escaping them. And so he and his friend, Frederick Engels, published a pamphlet now called the Communist Man Manifesto, which basically summarized the critique of capitalism. And his view was that Capitalism was an advance on feudalism because it produced tremendous wealth. However, it produced meaningless poverty and misery. And so his idea was that while the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, which we can see in some ways today. But then although it does, it does cause that, it still, in some cases, it can cause the ability for people to get past the gap, but then it's not possible for everyone to do so. And yeah, so now you also have basically responses to industrialization in places such as the Ottoman Empire, China, and Japan. And so the thing with the Ottomans in China is that in, in those places, reforms basically provoke backlash from the more conservative members of society due to those reforms basically removing centuries of tradition that were already placed, even if those traditions were flawed in the age that they are now. And so this basically handicapped those, those countries until they were basically humiliated by the Europeans and they had to modernize 
into who they are now. But then in Japan, Japan respond to industrialization by industrializing themselves, which I talked about before. And this industrialization was extremely effective. However, it created nationalism as a byproduct, which also uh, led to more pain and misery for people in China, Korea, and other, other territories that Japan conquered. And so just like a TLDR, it's just basically it, when it comes to most East Asian countries, reforms provoke backlash from conservative members of society. So that's all you need to know if you just want to take the simple thing out of it. So 5.9, society in the industrial age. So this is the last one. So what you have is you have the rich versus poor argument. And so the thing is in the industrial society, it still didn't change too much from feudalism with, with the poor not having too good of a living conditions. And so due to the increased urbanization, you had tenements and slums, which also can be seen in countries today, such as in India, uh, uh, Brazil, and, uh, and China. And you can even see it in other modern countries too, such as the United States, you know, uh, Korea, and yeah, so on and so forth. And so the thing is, is that these slums had polluted water and open sewers, which led to a lot of disease. However, this time also led to the creation of fire and police departments in order to increase the security in those areas. And so this time basically was a creation again, like led to the rise of who we are today, how things run today. And so the how industrialization affected the class structure was basically by creating a new working class. And this working class were basically easily replaceable due to needing pure skills. You just need to know how to operate X machinery. And these people worked in the cities instead of farms. And so it led to a rapid shift into more industrial societies rather than staying in the farms in the country, in the suburban area. And the effect on the environment of uh, industrialization is they increase air pollution and water pollution by a lot. And the water pollution basically led to a sharp increase in disease, which also was allowed to spread extremely quick. However, uh, there were ways to mitigate this by the creation of germ theory and other ways to stop the spread that were starting to become more, more effective as time grew on. And now you, the last thing, the legacy of the industrialized, it, sorry, the industrial revolution. And so the Industrial Revolution led to capitalism, which basically was mass production and making goods cheaper and easier to work with. However, with this, you also had the rise of consumerism, which is basically the just buying stuff that you didn't need. And with the stuff that you didn't need, what do you do with it? You throw it away or you, you most people throw it away. They don't donate it. And some stuff you can't donate. So that caused harm to the environment. And that basically made it so much harder to, to stop poor earth from, oh, yeah. And along with that, it read, it basically was, although not a direct factor, it, it uh, unintentionally led to the rise of inequality in society with colonialism, wage gaps, and et cetera. So I guess that's pretty much it for unit five. So I hope you learned something today and I guess good luck with the AP test and I hope you all stay safe.